É, boa noite, gente. Eu tenho aqui uma, uma má notícia e uma boa notícia. É, vou, vou começar pela má notícia, né? A má notícia é que o Jim não vem presencialmente. Ele embarcou no avião. A gente, o Serviço Florestal Americano, que é um parceiro da rede, pagou a passagem do Jim. Ele entrou no avião, ele voou da casa dele no Colorado até Dallas, no Texas. Teve uma tempestade de neve. O avião ficou 10 horas em Dallas e ele perdeu a conexão. Então, ele voltou para o Colorado. A boa notícia é que ele quer falar para vocês e ele vai falar para vocês por é, vídeo. Ele preparou uma puta palestra, não, uma excelente palestra, <risos> e, e, vai, e vai falar para vocês. É, para quem é, não, não sabe, é, o Serviço Florestal Americano e a Universidade do Colorado, da qual o Jim é professor, são um dos grandes padrinhos da Rede Brasileira de Trilhas. É, desde que está aqui Sônia Kinker, Paulo Faria e eu estávamos no time lá da, da Diman, a gente conseguiu fazer com que a parceria do Serviço Florestal deixasse de ser só proteção e fogo e passasse a integrar um componente de uso público. É uma luta desgraçada que, assim, no longo, não, no, no curto prazo custou meu cargo, mas, mas enfim, a, 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 carreira, a, 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 a parceria continuou e gerou frutos. É, a gente, há quantos anos faz isso? 15, 10? Não sei. Há 10 anos atrás, a gente não tinha quadros no ICMBio que soubessem pensar trilhas estrategicamente, taticamente e tecnicamente. Fazer manejo, fazer sinalização. Hoje, o ICMBio está repleto de quadros. É, um deles é um dos padrinhos da rede brasileira de trilhas, é um cara que está desde o início, que carrega, quando eu conheci ele, era, ainda era criancinha, fazia trabalho, fazia trabalho infantil, carregou um morão nas costas para viver, implementou uma das primeiras travessias da rede, que é a travessia dos veadeiros, né, a travessia das sete quedas, que hoje é parte do Caminho dos Goiás. E ele foi uma das pessoas que foi ser capacitada pelo Jim, nos Estados Unidos. Eu acho que ele é, vai ser muito mais capaz do que eu de apresentar o Jim para vocês. Eu vou chamar ele aqui, Paulo Faria, por favor, venha apresentar Jim Barbarak para todo mundo. Quero só terminar dizendo duas coisas. A primeira, o Jim é um craque. A segunda, ele vai falar inglês, mas ele sabe falar português, ele está é com preguiça. E a terceira, é para quem não entende inglês, tem tradução simultânea, é só pegar o fone. Tá? Paulinho, está contigo. Legal, Pedro. Obrigado. Bom, sendo muito breve, é muito honroso apresentar o Jim aqui, porque o Jim hoje ele é assessor do Centro de Pesquisa em Áreas Protegidas da Universidade Estadual do Colorado, nos Estados Unidos, mas ele é ex-diretor desse mesmo centro de pesquisa, e junto com a equipe dele, Ryan Finch, um, junto com o Larry Leshner, que trabalhou muito no Brasil desde o início da década de 90, todos eles têm nos formado. Eles têm investido em capacitação de técnicos brasileiros, em gestão, manejo de áreas protegidas, manejo de trilhas, planejamento de trilhas. E o trabalho que foi feito pelo Jim Barborak, ele, sem dúvida, ele foi um dos alicerces dessa girada de chave, do desenvolvimento do uso público como, como ferramenta de conservação, desse movimento de abertura, ou melhor, abertura das unidades de conservação para visitação e para o turismo, o desenvolvimento dos principais marcos técnicos e marcos normativos do ICMBio nos últimos dez anos, tem o dedo, tem o DNA do DIM e de toda a equipe técnica que ele representa, dessa cooperação que é histórica e foi muito importante para a gente, não só com a Universidade do Colorado, mas com o Serviço Florestal dos Estados Unidos, Serviço de Parques e outras universidades norte-americanas. Então... É, eu, não sei, eu não sei como é que eu chamo o Jim aqui, é, mas bem-vindo, Jim, ao primeiro Congresso Brasileiro de Trilhas. Valeu. Muito obrigado. Pode me escutar? Irã, você pode levantar a mão se você me, me escuta? Sim, escutando. Perfeito. Bem, pessoal, primeiro, uh, 
Peso disculpas por no poder participar personalmente en el evento por los problemas que o Pedro ya, ya mencionó. Quiero uh, agradecer a Hedge Brasileira de Trillas de Longo Curso, al gobierno de Goiás, a Goiás Turismo, y también, particularmente, como ya habló Pedro, del Servicio Florestal de los Estados Unidos y USAID, uh, que uh, me apoyan a las actividades uh, minas y do, do equipe do Centro para el Estado de, de Áreas Protegidas de la Universidad Estadual in, de Colorado en in, in Brasil, como se me vio y con muchas otras uh, uh, instituciones públicas y privadas. Ahora, yo voy a mudar al inglés, más toda la presentación es en portugués. Y pido disculpas por eso también eh, para aprovechar al máximo el tiempo y no tener problemas uh, es, eh, con esquecer pala palabras importantes en la palestra. Ok, my translator, Denise, are you ready? Sí, ella está te oyendo, Jim. Ok. Entonces, ¿puedo comenzar en inglés, Irance? Yes. All right. Today, I'm going to talk about lessons from the U.S. Forest Service regarding the quality of tourism services, visitor experience, the use of partnerships, and strengthening local communities. The U.S. Forest Service is one of the oldest protected area agencies in the world, created in 1905. It has over 117 years of experience and it manages 155 national forests and 20 national grasslands across 43 states of the United States. It manages 78 Pedro, million Pedro, Please. One one minute because I have some people get the headphone. Okay, one minute, please. Okay, I'll wait. Should I start over again, Iranse? It's okay. Just let me know when to start, please. Pedro vai guardar um minuto enquanto vocês pegam o headphone, é o fone de ouvido aí na no auditório. Perfeito. Fones estão no, no hall do auditório, logo na entrada. Ok, Jim. Can I continue now? Continue. Also? Ok. So, the United States Forest Service, which is a unit within our ministry or Department of Agriculture, is a very old and large institution, managing over 78 million hectares across 43 states, or most of the United States. Uh, it has to deal with tremendous problems with forest fires, which have become more of an issue with climate change and longer fire seasons. And it works with over 10,000 forest fighters, both government employees and volunteers and partners every year. The agency has over 30,000 employees. I think that's more than 10 times what ISIMI Bio has. And so it's a very, very large institution and it manages a vast area of public lands that receive nearly 200 million visitors each year. Here you can see the distribution of the national forest and all most of them are in the Western United States or Alaska a large number, and some of these are among the most visited, are in the more populated part of the United States, in the eastern United States. This is a map of my state of Colorado, which is the only rectangular state. And you can see that in my state, the Forest Service is the most important 
land management agency, managing protected areas that run a corridor right through the state from south to north. These include in my state, the most visited national forest like White River and Arapaho Roosevelt, which get on the order of 10 million visitors a year. So very, very high levels of visitation to many of these areas. So I first wanna go through some general lessons of the Forest Service from its over a century of managing protected areas in the United States regarding trails and protected areas, and also based not only on the work the Forest Service does in the United States, but on the work it has done for many decades, not just in Brazil, but in over 90 countries around the world where it collaborates in protected area management, including lots of work, not, not only on fires for, for which it might be most noted in forest management, but also on public use and tourism. The first lesson I would like to share with you is how can trails and protected areas, uh, uh, the systems grow, how can they survive and how can they last? And one of the key lessons of the Forest Service, of the US Forest Service, is making areas user friendly, not just for visitors from other countries, but also visitors from the United States in this case, and from local communities, not just from distant tourism poles. And also, how can it interest all citizens in protecting protected areas and including decision makers in the public and private sectors. So one of the first lessons is making your areas user friendly and making them something that people of all levels of income, urban and rural from across your country, including powerful decision makers in and out of government see as something that produces economic benefits, health benefits, recreational benefits, pride and is seen as just as important as protecting cultural heritage or other uh, important parts of the national uh, uh, culture. The second lesson, and you will see that many of the photos I'm going to show you are not from the United States, but they're rather illustrations of these principles in Brazil, such as the photo above of the floating lodge, Uacari Lodge, in uh, Mamirawa Sustainable Development Reserve in Amazona State. So the second lesson is that there are many different types of partnerships that a good protected areas agency, a good trail management agency, because the Forest Service manages directly six of the 30 national trails in the United States and is a partner in management of the 11 others. In other words, of the, of the 30 national trails in the United States, the Forest Service is directly involved in managing 17 of these long distance trails. So what, what is one of the lessons here that you need to use a variety of types of contracts, agreements, concessions, authorizations, co-management, et cetera, to manage a public protected areas be these national, like the areas that Isimi Bio manages, state protected areas, like those managed by the state of Goyas, or municipal protected areas, like those managed by prefeituras, or local governments in Brazil. A second thing is that it's important to remember lessons that Benton Mackay, the founder of the Appalachian Trail, preached about over a century ago. And that is that you cannot do all of the development within protected areas, particularly small ones. It is important that much of the tourism development be in gateway communities, be in the towns that exist in the mosaic of protected areas, but where we're not putting in danger the biodiversity and cultural resources of the protected area, building too much infrastructure inside so that although we need to build infrastructure inside protected areas, particularly when they're small and there are communities nearby, it often makes more sense to put the infrastructure such as hotels, souvenir shops, restaurants, guide service headquarters outside of the limits of the protected area. The third thing is that 
while government owned and managed protected areas are important, so are private reserves, such as the network of thousands of RPPNs in Brazil. Excuse me. <coughs> and so protected areas managed by the national government, in this case, ACMEBIO, need to be complemented by state protected area systems, as you have throughout Brazil, municipal systems, private reserves, and then also, and this is extremely important in Brazil, it also has to be accompanied by better and more professional management of indigenous territories by the people that live in them. Finally, any development of tourism, including trail networks, requires careful and participatory planning based on an analysis of the resources of a protected area or a potential trail segment and should try to create new, new tourism destinations, new tourism attractions, and trails that are appropriate given the resources of an area. It's not just to copy what's already been done elsewhere. I often say that I've seen so many identical canopies in Latin America that I'm sick of them because everyone just copies what someone else does. So it's important to innovate and to think about what can be done better and different than what is done in other protected areas and other trail segments to make them unique and attractive to visitors from the same municipality, from the same state, from Brazil and from around the world. The third lesson is that successful design, planning, construction, maintenance, and operation of trail networks and other infrastructure requires a number of different types of personnel, many of whom do not have to be public employees, even in public protected areas. Obviously, full-time professional staff, people like my good friend Paolo, or like Pedro, government employees are extremely important in managing protected area systems. People who are full-time civil service professionals devoting their life to doing good things for their country. But just as important in the long run is using a whole series of other options. I call it a menu, a cardapio of options of personnel to have enough personnel to adequately plan, construct, and operate trail systems. So this includes part-time personnel, seasonal personnel, brigades like you have in Brazil that work now both on fire and on other aspects of protected area management. It requires contracts for specific uh, outside work on things like bridges, for example, that might require specialized construction companies with the skills and the equipment and the expertise to do a good job and create safe infrastructure such as, such as trails or overlooks, for example. It can also utilize concessions. And as I think all of you know, in the past 10 years in Brazil, there's been a great increase in the use of concessions, contracts, and authorizations, which are the three alternatives used by ICMEBIO, but also this is being done by state and local governments. Hardly a week goes by when I do not hear about a new competition for a new uh, uh, concession of some type or another in a Brazilian protected areas, because these private partners can bring expertise and capital money to the game and help to improve and diversify visitor services. They can also help generate money that's important to build and maintain infrastructure, including trail systems. Uh, and the newer generation of concessions agreements in Brazil are among the best in the world at trying to achieve a balance between the welfare of the concessionaire and the needs of the government. In addition, it's very important to use the skills of other agencies Many municipal and state protected areas agencies, for example, are never going to have engineers, civil engineers and planners on staff to be able to do much of the detailed design of the infrastructure their protected area systems needs. So they very might need to work together with, for example, public works ministries. In a number of countries of Latin America, and this is true in the United States, the military sometimes help out because they all have their cores of engineers the Corps of Engineers of the Army in the United States 
manages directly protected areas visited by hundreds of millions of visitors a year. Another thing, and this is something the Forest Service does very well in the United States, it works together with universities like mine and many others uh, in the United States and also in Brazil. For example, in Brazil, the University of West Virginia, the University of Montana, and my University of Colorado State have all been collaborating with the Forest Service and with the CMEBO and other partners on a program of activities. And this also includes universities in Brazil, like the University of Brasilia, for example. Uh, in addition, uh, it's important to use interns, uh, stagiarios in Portuguese, uh, to help build professional capacity and get a lot of things done by thesis projects and the like that would not be possible with the, uh, the normal personnel assigned to a protected area. I, I always, often say that ECMEBO, for example, which manages a protected area system as large as of that of the federal government of the United States, does it with only a couple of thousand employees. Uh, and uh, the Forest Service in the United States has 30,000 and the Park Service has 20,000 and there are other agencies as well. So in a situation like Brazil's, where the federal government has so few personnel to manage a vast protected area system, and this is also true with state governments in Brazil, it is even more important to use this whole range of options to meet personnel needs since there are so few servidores, so few public employees working in conservation. And finally, and I know my colleagues uh, from uh, other institutions like Angela Pelin uh, from IPE, I think are going to talk about the issue of the importance of volunteers. And in Brazil in the last decade, there's a, been a huge boom in the role and the number of volunteers in protected areas. And I'm very happy to see this. And the US Forest Service has also supported this work done by, by IPE and other institutions in collaboration with ACMEBIO and other institutions of, uh, of the government to uh, increase the role of volunteers. The US Forest Service relies on a vast network of partners that mobilize many, many thousands of volunteers each year to help particularly maintain trails, build new trail segments, uh, and uh, do other associated tasks like work on signage and other simple infrastructure and protected areas. So the US Forest Service uses this whole range of options of types of personnel, direct and indirect, uh, to meet its personnel needs. And building and maintaining and managing trails requires lots of personnel with different skills and, and it's impossible for any agency to think that all of that personnel is going to come from inside their permanent personnel ranks. The fourth lesson is to use partnerships as much as possible. Uh, the government normally is not a good provider of direct tourism services. And that for that reason, alliances with tourism operators, communities, and other government agencies such as ministries or institutes of tourism always work better than isolated events. I always use this photo from my days when I worked with WCS in Latin America, showing personnel of uh, Parque Nacional Tijuca, which is a great example in Brazil of a protected area among the most visited in all of Latin America that has involvement of the federal government, of the municipal government, the prefectura, of the Catholic Church, and of several large concessionaires and many smaller ones to adequately manage this protected area which gets millions of visitors a year. So what types of partnerships do we need? We need partnerships with a whole series of different actors, not only protected areas agencies, but government at all levels, local communities, the private for-profit sector, NGOs, and indigenous communities and local communities, aside from that. We also need the help of other types of partners as well. Uh, different types of organizations like the Red Cross and, and uh, ambulance services in the case of, of issues of security, universities, public security agencies, training centers. We, we need support of the religious community because COVID has taught us the importance of spirituality and of mental health as it relates to protected area management. I think my good friend Tiago Souza is in attendance. And I remember from his doctoral thesis that one of the largest groups of visitors to protected areas in Brazil 
are, are Christians going to get baptized and have spiritual retreats? So this is very important as well. So you need a whole range of partners, including researchers as well, to do research on the impacts of trails, uh, both economic and ecological, and how to uh, accentuate the positive impacts and deal with those negative ones. A fifth lesson from the US Forest Service is that a very high percentage of the visitation, this is much more so than in the case of the US National Park Service, which draws people from around the world. I just came back from Yellowstone and in spite of the COVID travel restrictions, many of the visitors there were from abroad. Uh, our US National Forests tend to draw in more local users, uh, people who go to swim, to fish, like me, to hunt, uh, things like deer, uh, to uh, go gather berries, that's allowed, to go get a Christmas tree. All types of different uses are allowed in our national forest, and they are very, very much part of the fabric of local society. And so it is extremely important to provide opportunities for recreation, but also most of the concessionaires in the U.S. national forest system are not, not large companies from big cities. Most of the concessionaires or the, or the outfitter guides are actually local people, ranchers, farmers, and people who seasonally off, operate horseback rides, off-road vehicle rides, service hunting and fishing guides, etc., to uh, improve the enjoyment of visitors to protected areas. And if many more opportunities are given for local people, the Forest Service has found, to make, make a living off of the protected area in a positive way, this reduces the probability that the local people are going to be enemies of the protected area and do illegal activities like poaching or illegal timber uh, harvesting or mining, et cetera, within the limits of the protected area. And so the lesson here is that to the extent that local people love their protected areas, use them for recreation and other traditional activities and gain, gain good employment from them and income opportunities, they will be supporters of the protected area and not enemies. The next lesson is that not all of the involvement of local communities necessarily has to be in tourism. Uh, it's very dangerous, as we've seen with COVID, to have excessive reliance on tourism, particularly international tourism, which is more fickle and more prone to ups and downs uh, than national and local tourism. But much of the work of actually building and maintaining trails and other infrastructure can and should be done by local communities. I've seen this in a number of countries. This photo above is from El Salvador, uh, where we trained uh, with support from the Forest Service, a whole series of uh, local uh, trail specialists. And uh, they then were hired to go around the country building and maintaining trails once they gained that expertise. Uh, many people who are not interested in working in tourism directly can produce food uh, for visitors. Uh, they can support research as research assistants. They can get involved as rangers, as Guardas Parque. Uh, they can work uh, in a restoration ecology of degraded areas, a huge issue, for example, in the Atlantic Forest. They can participate in management committees, which are mandatory in Brazil. And they can work as local volunteers. I think it's very important that volunteering not be seen as something only done by the urban elites, but something that local people, even if they have limited resources, can also contribute to. I want to talk to you a tale of two parks right now. The park on the left is one I have had the pleasure of visiting. It's Cantarera. That is Sao Paulo. That is green space in the middle of 20 million people. The photo on the right is the same. That's Central Park in New York. It's only several hundred hectares. It's even smaller than Cantarera. But you know what? It's the third most visited tourist attraction in the world. And it's an urban park. It has, as you can see, a whole series of walking paths and biking paths it's visited by 38 million people a year. That's more than go to any one of the largest of the Brazilian recreational destinations where you have water parks, 38 million a year. It's only surpassed by Las Vegas and by Times Square also in New York. 
as far as the tourism flows it's get as a green lung in the heart of the city. But if you ask how many people go a year to Cantereira, you'll find out that it's a tiny fraction of that amount. So what can we do in Brazil's protected areas, both to promote long distance trails, but also to hook people by getting them into green space around cities where they probably will have their first introduction to taking a nature hike maybe with an interpretive guide. The U.S. Forest Service manages many remote areas. It manages vast wilderness areas, but many of the national forests are very near large cities like San Francisco, like Los Angeles, like New York. Uh, and so these national forests that are urban national forests uh, are extremely important in hooking people on outdoor recreation. And so this is some, a lesson from the U.S. Forest Service that I think can be shared in Brazil. So we need to use the urban protected areas, such as those managed by Seshke in Sao Paulo that get many, many visitors. How can they get more visitors? And how can these urban park visitors then be turned into people who love to take longer distance hikes and visit protected areas around Brazil? A seventh lesson, going back to this idea of making areas user-friendly. One of the interesting ways, and I like this example from uh, uh, your state of Goiás and, and Chaparral de Federos is the creation of a friends group. This is very common in U.S. national forests. Most of them have an NGO that is called Friends of Such and Such National Forest. And so I think that this recent example from Chaparral de Federos, I remember there used to be one in Tijuca as well, is extremely important. And many of the people that tend to get involved in these friends groups in the United States are mountain bikers, they're sport fishermen, they're sport hunters, they love to go off-roading with their uh, by, uh, with uh, their motorbikes or their by four by four vehicles. And I know this is very common in Brazilian beaches, for example. And so these are these are regular users who love the protected areas and who get involved in their management. Uh, it, but the lesson from around the world is that you can make an area user friendly but you don't need to necessarily build gigantic visitor centers and invest millions of dollars in infrastructure. What you do need is good trails, good guides, good interpretive services, good security and decent restrooms. If you have those things, people will come and they will enjoy your area. So uh, it is very important to understand that safety is important, that security is important, and that creating the minimal conditions for your visitors to have uh, unforgettable experiences is possible without investing vast amounts of money. Most of the infrastructure in U.S. National Forest is actually quite limited. It's trails, it's signs, there's a website, there might be a very small visitor center, some overlooks, but the most important aspect of the infrastructure is always trails. Trails that are well designed, that are safe, that are maintained and uh, that really open the door to visitation of protected areas. Also important uh, is uh, to think about uh, keeping your areas open. In the United States, in the heart of COVID in 2020, visitation to the US National Forest System actually increased over 10%, even though all the areas were closed for several months in early 2020 when COVID first broke out. Why? Because people need to recreate. They need a break. They need mental health. They need physical health. They want to do outdoor activities. And so if you keep your areas open, uh, that will happen. And I use here the famous case of Parque Nacional Pau Brasil that was closed uh, for a long period of time, I think by order of the courts for lacking a management plan, but I'm happy to hear that now has a concessionaire and uh, has reopened uh, to the public. An eighth lesson is that although partnerships with for-profit companies, be they small, medium, or large, to run hotels, to run transportation services, to run guide services, all that's important. But equally important is partnerships to promote environmental education. Because if there's one overall lesson from the US Forest Service and the US Protected Area System, it's the importance of hooking of attracting children when they're young. If you wait until people are adults, the possibility of changing their mind about outdoor recreation is somewhat limited. But if from the age of four and five, when they are in the scouts, 
Boy and Girl Scouts, when they go with a church group, when they go on an environmental education trip with their science teacher in middle school, all of these activities help to hook people on outdoor recreation, on being uh, regular trail users, and on loving and working to protect uh, natural areas. And so it's very important not only to have concessionaires and partnerships with for-profit entities, it's extremely important to work with both public schools and private schools. I often remind people that private schools are where most of the future leaders are being educated. And uh, also to work uh, with uh, universities and teacher training institutes to really ensure that all children have the right and opportunity to visit natural areas at a young age. Many uh, children in the United States, it's, all, it's almost like a rite of passage and my children and my grandchildren have done this, to go to camps when you're in, for example, the fifth grade of primary school during your summer break or your winter break and actually be immersed in nature for a period of time. Many of these parks are operated through partnerships in our national forest. And these provide an important way of hooking children, of getting them interested in nature at an early age. A ninth lesson I would like to share with you is uh, the fundamental importance of building capacity. It's not enough just to hire staff. It's important to train staff and train partners at all levels. Everything from formal education and university programs on conservation and tourism, for example, in short courses, through coaching and mentoring and shadowing, uh, through experiences, through staff exchanges, by creating associations of things like, like in the United States, we have the Association of Trail Builders, a professional organization of, for the most part, small companies that are specialized in building and maintaining trails. Uh, communication skills is very important. We're, we need to do a better job at marketing our protected areas. Uh, uh, building leadership skills. Uh, it's great to be a trail user. It's great to be a trail advocate, but we need to develop leadership uh, skills to uh, influence other individuals and institutions to play a role in, in designing and building uh, trail systems and increasing the uh, quality of the management of our protected areas. And we need demonstration sites and demonstration trails. I highly recommend that you do this. And this has been used in the United States for a century. Uh, you need to have some sites that you really work on developing fully with a whole range of visitor services. Uh, and uh, this is an example of a workshop at Analvianas National Park in Amazonas State, which has been one of several pilot demonstration sites on which the U.S. Forest Service has collaborated with my university and other U.S. universities and Brazilian universities and DCMBO and local actors such as tour guides uh, to develop uh, infrastructure, public use plans, and to increase visitation. Another one I'll talk about in a minute is Tapajos National Forest in uh, Pará State. Uh, and, and the next lesson is, it is wonderful to have well-designed trails, uh, good trails with, with steady slopes that do not erode, but it's also important to think about interpretation, both personalized with a guide, with a conductor, or through signage and web information. It's not enough to just open the door to people to visit our protected areas and our trails if we're not providing any orientation so that they actually enjoy and learn and get inspired by their visits. So it's extremely important to see the physical development of trail networks as linked to interpretation. Now, this is particularly important on small loop trails in an urban protected areas, the Tijucas and Iguazus and those types of areas that get most of the visitation to Brazil's protected area system or that in the United States. So once again, we can get people interested in going further afield and becoming long, long distance trail users over a period of time. 11th lesson from the US Forest Service. Every five years, every single national forest has a, an intensive comprehensive study done of the behavior of visitors the demographics of visitors and their expenditures to be able to demonstrate what visitors want, what visitors are doing, what they would like to do if there were better facilities, 
and infrastructure? And also, what are they spending their money on? What is their impact on the local community? Because one of the best ways that the Forest Service has used now for over a century to justify its very large budget of billions of dollars, to justify the number of people it has on staff, is the incredible economic value of the National Forest. Some of this has to do with the fact that it's a multiple use agency. So wood is produced on it, uh, wildlife is produced, water resources are produced, but a very large and growing part of its economic impact is tourism and recreation. And so by doing these comprehensive studies every few years, the Forest Service can justify to uh, the Congress, to the president, to the executive, uh, the budgets it needs to manage these areas by demonstrating how much every dollar invested in protected areas gives back in benefit to the economy. And I'd like to applaud Isimi Beal for what it's done over the past few years, Paolo, Pedro, and others working uh, in Isimi Beal, Tiago, et cetera, to really increase uh, the amount of information about this in Brazil as well. Uh, a 12th lesson I'd like to share is regarding uh, environmental education partnerships. I mentioned already this idea of creating friends association, the importance of creating foundations and organizations to support environmental education. This is a wonderful area where there can also be collaboration with the for-profit sector. Think of all of the stores in Brazil that make money off of selling brands like North Face and Patagonia and high tech and specialized bicycles, and kayaks, and fishing gear. And much of all that equipment is being used in protected areas. It's extremely important in the United States. That's one thing the Forest Service has managed to do, and other agencies like the Park Service, build partnerships with the companies that make their living off of selling products that people use to recreate. And much of this is done, then invested in programs to help improve public use and environmental education. Now, having given you those lessons from the operations of the Forest Service, as mentioned, it is active in over nine, 90 countries around the world. Uh, since 1990, now for over 30 years, it's been working in partnership with the Brazilian government. And it works also in a number of other countries in Latin America on issues such as fire management and control, public use, disease outbreaks, and other issues related to forest management. Uh, in Brazil, uh, the U.S. Forest Service has recently begun a new, a new program on management and prevention of fire in Brazil, but that also includes components regarding public use, uh, involvement of women in conservation leadership, et cetera. So over the next few years, the Forest Service is going to continue to collaborate uh, on the issue of fire, which is of growing importance in Brazil. I have followed personally the disasters with the major fires, not only in the Amazon, but the less reported fires in the Pantanal and the other ecosystems as well. And so the whole idea to improve forest management and provide value added while also helping to contribute to fighting climate change. Uh, a key aspect of this program is to reach out more to the indigenous communities that are responsible for, for much of the uh, 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 of the protected area coverage in the Amazon in particular, and uh, to collaborate not only within Brazil, but with neighboring countries as well on these issues. And uh, it has components regarding fire management, governance and management of forest resources, and sustainable use of protected areas, in, uh, uh, which in includes public use. In the last phase of the U.S. Forest Service collaboration in Brazil, I want to mention an example of what it's, what it's helped to do in Brazil in a couple of areas in particular. I already mentioned Anovianas. I mentioned uh, as well that uh, uh, the Forest Service has collaborated in the Floresta Nacional Tapajós, uh, which is over half a million hectares, very known for research and for good management of natural forests, but with without much uh, uh, publicity regarding its role, potential role in tourism development. Uh, and so the U.S. Forest Service worked together with this EMEBO and with uh, local governments and local organizations, including the cooperative that manages uh, forestry within the area and the communities. Some of them are mixed blood, some of them are, 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 are indigenous, to promote artisanry using things like rubber, uh, to promote uh, development of uh, conductores, of, of a better guide service, 
to gather information regarding the impact of tourism and these activities in the area, uh, working with local communities uh, that depend on the resources that are part of the cooperatives, designing and constructing trails, uh, building the capacity of local guides to do a better job as interpreters, uh, developing a mobile interpretation uh, mochila with information they can take with them to the field instead of relying on expensive signs, and also con uh, constructing uh, interpretive panels, and finally uh, rehabilitating a visitor center in Alter de Chau, which is very near the area and which is visited by cruise ships and a huge number of visitors each year, most of whom did not even know about Tapajos or visit it, even though they were a few kilometers away. So this is a good example of how the U.S. Forest Service with its own personnel uh, in partnership with U.S. universities like my own, working with SMEBO, working with local governments, working with local peoples, collaboratively worked over a number of years to improve infrastructure, including trails, to include uh, to improve visitor services and to provide more opportunities for the local community to diversify their livelihoods as well. Uh, I'd now like to close by just basically in just a few slides talking not about the U.S. Forest Service, but about uh, my university, Colorado State University, uh, and its role in protect areas management and particularly in Brazil. Uh, my colleagues, Dr. George Wallace, Craig McFarland, and particularly Larry Lechner, who was already mentioned, began to work with Fundação Boticario in Salto Morato, helping to train the first generation of trilistas, of specialists in trails in Brazil, over three decades ago. We're very proud of that pioneering role we, we played, and we're proud of the role that we've continued to play, both in training events in Brazil and in the United States, and providing technical assistance to promote a uh, larger trail network, better interpretation of those trails, uh, and uh, in general, contributing to local communities as well. We have uh, continued to collaborate with uh, Boticario Foundation, with Instituto Semea, particularly on the issue of partnerships and concessions, with the Fundación Florestal. We've also collaborated on the issue of concessions with Isimibio and Aquerebio, uh, with the Grupo de Pesquisa Sobre Uso Público de Unidades de Conservação. We've had a number of Brazilians in our master's programs and well over 100 in short courses in the United States. Uh, we're collaborating with SESCE on accessible trails and universal access, and also with IMPA uh, in protected areas in Bertioga, Sao Paulo, and uh, in the uh, uh, and in uh, uh, Manaus, in uh, Amazonas. And we continue to collaborate, as mentioned, with USAID and the US Forest Service. And we've given uh, many, many uh, short courses over the years in Brazil and the United States. Uh, we've had more Brazilians in our most famous course, which has been going on for 30 years, than for any other country. And we're very proud of that. And we also have a newer uh, course that's given every year in uh, until COVID times, we're going to start it again next year uh, in partnership with US Forest Service, USAID, SAMEA, uh, US National Park Service also provides support. And we've also had more Brazilians in that event than any of our, of our events in the United States. We're very, very proud of that and our longstanding ties. We've also organized special study tours for Brazilians on topics such as interpretation. This is a, a group of Isimi Bio employees specialized in interpretation and certified. We've also done this regarding counting visitors, regarding uh, trails. I actually went with several Brazilians uh, to the uh, International Trail Symposium in Ohio a couple of years ago. We visited a number of trails in Ohio. So we're continuing to try to collaborate most of the time in partnership with the US Forest Service and USAID as well in helping to build capacity of Brazilians to build trails, to improve infrastructure, and to improve management of your impressive world-class protected area system. So just to leave you with this last message with this beautiful slide from my colleague, Steve McCool, uh, who took this at Iguazu, and many of you know Steve, who's been another uh, one of the university partners through the University of Montana uh, and, uh, and the US Forest Service. Diversification of uh, public use greater use of partnerships, greater use of alliances is fundamental for the economic sustainability, ecological sustainability, and social sustainability of trails in protected areas in Brazil. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I know it's late. 
thanks to all of you for making this possible. To the translator, to the IT team, to everyone from the Forest Service and USAID, my colleagues from Missy Beal, and all the sponsors of this extremely important event. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Jim. Vamos abrir para as perguntas. E eu gostaria que quem está no auditório utilizasse o microfone para fazer a sua pergunta, que o, o, o Jim consegue nos ouvir, né? Som, som. Só levanta a mão, pessoal. Ninguém? Acho que há fome na sala. Boa noite, aqui quem fala é Larissa, do ICMBio, atualmente estou na chefia da Floresta Nacional de Brasília e área de proteção ambiental Bacia do Descoberto. Jim, um abraço para vocês. Eu, a minha pergunta, já perguntei para o Ryan, mas eu vou repetir aqui. Eu quero saber quando que vocês vão retomar a agenda de cursos presenciais, se tem alguma perspectiva. Bem, uh, no próximo ano vamos começar novamente com o, o curso internacional de, de um mês em, em espanhol e o seminário em inglês. Vão ter algumas uh, mudanças nos programas, na agenda, vamos fazer parte deles uh, em forma virtual, em linha, e vamos uh, tentar uh, convertir os cursos em comunidades de uh, aprendizagem de, de longo prazo, onde os participantes vão participar em várias sessões virtuais antes de viajar aos Estados Unidos e depois de voltar ao Brasil, nesse caso, vão continuar uh, em colaboração, em comunicação com este, os outros participantes dos outros países também. Uh, quero dizer também que estamos colaborando com o SESC São Paulo em vários cursos que eles estão fazendo sobre unidades de conservação em, em Bertioga e parcialmente também virtualmente. E também uh, estamos colaborando com a uh, WWF uh, em os cursos que eles estão fazendo, particularmente para o pessoal uh, do Pantanal. Então, sempre uh, temos também interesse em colaborar com outros Uh, instituições públicas e privadas em fazer capacitação uh, virtual e fazer eventos em Brasil ou eventos desenhados especificamente para brasileiros nos Estados Unidos, como alguns que hemos feito no passado. Mais alguém? Mais ninguém, Irã? Ok. Então, Jim, nós queremos te agradecer pelo seu sua participação aqui com a gente. Importante, né, essa, é, demonstrar para todos nós, eu acho que, que a, a sua fala ao encontro da, das apresentações que vieram ao longo do dia, parceria, colaboração, é a bola da vez para que a gente faça esse sistema, né, a rede brasileira de trilhas, né, o acontecer de forma coesa, que possa crescer, desenvolver as economias, as microeconomias locais, ecossocioeconomias, enfim, é a sua fala ao encontro dessa realidade. Eu agradeço aqui em nome da Rede Brasileira de Trilhas, em nome da, da Goiás Turismo, do Governo de Goiás, a sua participação aqui com a gente. Muito obrigado a todos. E espero ver-lhes em pessoa uh, em pouco tempo. Ok. Obrigado, boa noite a todos. Amanhã, retornando nossas atividades, a partir das 9 horas, é nosso espaço aqui de, de, com food truck, com rapel, tirolesa, continua aberto, né? Vocês podem vir para cá e vai ter um show especial aqui. O Jim não vai poder acompanhar a gente no show, Jim, vai ficar para outra oportunidade, mas quem está aqui, vai ali para a área do Ex Trilhas e vamos aproveitar esse momento. Boa noite a todos, nos vemos.